So let's see what she, what they, what they want us to do with that data, right? Okay, law of reflection. Okay, law, according to the law of reflection, the angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. If you were to plot data, oh, let's see. Yeah, they there's a there's a typo here, okay? There's a typo here. According to the law of reflection, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. They put angle of transmission here. See that? There is a it's supposed to be R, not the, Am I, am I sharing the screen? Wait a minute. No. Sorry. Yeah, here you go. Okay, take a look here. They put uh, they put a theta t instead of theta r. Okay. So let let me see if I have. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna put. Uh, I'm gonna highlight that. Uh, well, you, you got the idea, right? I, I'm not gonna do all on that. Uh, it's taking too long. Here's the same thing, right? If you're to plot take theta r versus theta i, you go. What would you predict on the slope and vertical intercept of your graph? Okay. We go. Okay, slope. So you tell me what would be the slope? What would be the intercept based on this formula here? And let's go ahead and plot on the graph provided. Make a sketch of the linear graph you obtain use Excel. Just copy and paste from Excel. You don't have to. You want, let's see, theta r. Yeah, again, <laughs> they put theta, theta t everywhere here, right? They put theta t everywhere here. So let's plot. It was almost the same thing, right? It's insert. Scatter, here you go. If you go ahead and put the trend line, oh no, what was it doing here? Trend line, add trend line. Linear, play equation chart, oops. Play R squared, yeah be close to one, okay? I'm getting 0.995, which is very close to one. R squared is very close to one as well. And the intercept is very close to zero as well as the theory predicts. Over. Zoom out, close this one. Label the graphs, right, properly. And now we are going to go for the next part. It's Nell's law, law of refraction. And, and instead of refraction of the medium of transmission is time the sign of theta transmission is equal to the index of the refraction of the medium of incidence times the angle of the incidence. If you want to linear, linearize this equation, you gotta make this guy here equal to y and this go, guy here equal to x. Let's do that. That's why I calculate the sign of transmission and the sign of incidence. Let me see if I get got that here. Have notes. Here you go. 
Yeah. I made y equal to sign of transmission and x equal to the sign of incidence. And now we do have a linear equation. And what we're going to do? Oh, let's see. Oh, you know what? That should be theta of incidence, not theta of reflection. Let me see if I got the right. Yeah, that should be theta of incidence, not theta of reflection. Yeah, here you go. Let me switch that here. So go ahead, correct that if you made the same mistake that I made. The difference is very little, not, not a lot, but here you go. Now let's plot this one, state of transmission with state of incidence. Insert sign of state of incidence, right? Here you go. It's clearly is linear. Let's see what is the intercept and the slope. I'm getting a slope of 0.6472. The intercept is 0 0.0059. Okay. What I didn't write down was the refractive index, right? What refractive index are we using here in the simulation? Not this one, this one right in here. Refractive index of the air, refractive index of the glass, right? 1.5. And one. One point five and one. Here you go. Lab notes. Here you go. The slope should be one divided by one point five. And one divided by n two. Let's see what we get by if let's see if it matches our prediction or our. Experimental result. I'm getting 0.666, right? Here you go. Oh, 64. 0.64. There's a small percentage difference here. So here you go. I'm going to put that uh, in one. I'm going to use the notation of the book. Okay, and then we have the N of transmission, which is in the previous notation was N1 and N2 respectively. Nope. Huh, doesn't like it. Let's see if get that. Okay, now you got it. Here's 1.5, here's 1. Theoretical was 0.6667. Experimental was 0 0.6472. 0 0.6472. We can take the percentage difference between those two values. Let's see that. You go this one minus this one times 100 divided by the theoretical one. 2%, 2 percent difference only, 3% difference. Okay. Let's see what is the intercept. 
the intercept of it, very small as well, right? Here you go, 0, 0, 0059, supposed to be zero. Here you go, we did that. Now, there is a very nice analogy for this behavior of the light that you see. Let me see if I can find here in the internet this, you know, the fact that the light is bending towards the normal, okay? From lower refractive index to higher refractive index. Let's see if I can show you a, you know, Hewitt. Hewitt has a very nice explanation of traction. He has here in the internet. Oh yeah, he does. Uh, here you go. This guy is a genius, okay? So, uh, okay. Hang in there, I gotta share this computer sound with you. Share sound. How long is this video? Eight minutes. No, the pencil isn't really bent, although it appears to be. And physics teacher Bruce Illingworth in the pool doesn't really have his head displaced as it appears. The explanation for these strange appearances involves changes in the speed of light. Here we see a ray of light entering a pane of glass at an angle. The speed of light in a vacuum we call C constant. It's nearly C in air, but its average speed V inside the glass is considerably less than C. We see it emerges from the glass parallel to, but somewhat displaced from its initial path. Light changing speed from one material to another gives rise to refraction, the subject of this lesson. If you roll a pair of cartwheels Eagle. down a slight incline from sidewalk to grass. That's a very good analogy of what happens to light, okay? So what do you have here? You have, a, let's say you have a car, and here's the wheels of your car. And he's traveling here in the pavement. And here, the you know, car is going towards this grass field here. In the pavement, you have more traction and the car can go faster. In the grass, you don't have as much traction and the car goes slower. So what happens if you, your car is incident at this interface at an angle? What's gonna happen is the following. This wheel that first goes into the grass is gonna travel slower than this other wheel that is still in the, on the pavement. For this reason, this wheel here is gonna try to overtake the other one, okay? And this is actually what's happened to light rays as well. When you go from a medium where you're traveling faster to a medium that are traveling slower, your paths will be bent towards the normal. So this is a mechanical analogy that works very well for optics. That affects very well what happened in optics. Let's go play it again. A pair of cartwheels down a slight yeah. incline from sidewalk to grass, the wheels roll slower on the grass than on the sidewalk. Why? There is more interaction of wheel surfaces with grass than with the smoother sidewalk. If you roll the wheels at an angle, so one wheel meets the grass while the other is still on the sidewalk, the wheels will swivel from their straight line path. Due to the change in speed, the direction of travel changes. Likewise with light. Here we see wave fronts of light heading toward water. Light travels slower in water than in air because there's more interaction with the denser water than with thinner air. The wave fronts in this diagram represent wave crests of light. You can see how the wave fronts swivel when they meet the water surface. They bend from their original course. We say the rays are refracted. Note that the direction a ray is moving and its wave front are always at right angles to each other. Notice another thing. 
the distance between wave fronts is less in the water. Well, Interesting. That, the wavelength of waves know. is somewhat compressed. You don't have to know more than that. That's the analogy I want you to keep in mind. Okay. And the same thing happens when if the cart wheel was going from grass to the pavement. Okay. Its path would move away from the normal and also would happen to the to the light, light waves. Okay. Let's get out of that and go back to our lab here. Now we are going to talk about total internal reflection. Okay. It's a very important phenomenon that happens in optical fibers. And even in that, in that picture that you saw that I, in my website that I showed to you. Let's get that again. Here you go. Not this picture. But this picture here. Do you see what's happening here? You know, at the very first reflection, there is some water light leaking out. And maybe even the second reflection, there is some light leaking out. But at the third and fourth reflection, you don't see any light leaking out whatsoever. What is happening here is that at a certain angles of incidence, light does not leak out from inside a medium, from a medium that has a refractive index higher than the refractive index on the outside. This phenomenon we call total internal reflection. We get 100% of the light reflected right in here. If provided, of course, there is no absorb, absorb, uh, absorbance of the light. That's what we're going to study right now in this next activity, okay? Okay, total internal reflection is when transmission disappears and only reflection exists. It occurs only when the refractive index of the medium, of the incident medium is greater than the refractive index of the transmitted medium. So total internal reflection does not happen when light propagates from air to glass, but only flow from glass to, uh, towards air. The angle of incidence beyond which there will not be any transmitted light into a second medium is called the critical angle, okay? This is the angle of incidence at which the transmitted light comes out parallel to the surface, to the interface of the two boundaries. Okay, okay, and, uh, and this critical angle occurs uh, whenever the angle of transmission is 90 degrees. You can even substitute that in your equation right here for the Snell's law. Okay, so here goes sign of, in, of, in, of the angle of incident. Here goes sign of the angle of transmission. Angle of transmission 90 degrees. This sign here is going to be one. So when the theta of when the theta this the, the theta angle is equal to the inverse of the sign in of the medium of incident refractive in the medium trans, transmission, then we start to have total internal reflection. You're going to see that in the simulation, okay? Set the angle of incident of 45 degrees and change the incident medium to glass. We're gonna do that, here you go. Not here, right in here. Now you are going to make this medium here, glass. In the other medium, you're gonna make it air, okay? So here you go. I'm gonna take out this protractor so it doesn't get in the way. I'm gonna start at zero degrees. Right now, zero degrees, we still have transmission, right? Then you also have reflection. You'll see the reflection as the angle becomes steeper and steeper. See the reflection here? That's something that we can observe in real life, like I told you, just like in that picture that I took. Here you go. As I keep increasing the angle, not only this reflected light becomes stronger, but the transmitted light also become weaker. 
and look what it, it look at the angle here that you see is is it steeper right there will be a point in which this transmitted light is going to travel parallel to the interface that's when you end up having total internal reflection unfortunately i cannot control the angle in a final way let's see i can oh yeah here you go i can at least measure without a protractor All right so here you go if you move very slowly see that eventually it gets to 90 degrees the steepest angle that i can get is what 86 maybe 87 past this angle of incidence here you're going to have total internal reflection no light is transmitted and and it is total internal reflection why because a hundred percent of the light is reflected at this angle and that's the critical angle past this critical angle you still have total internal reflection it's a very important phenomenon in physics This is, this is used in telecommunications to transmit telephone, telephone, telephonic, you know, voice signals through optical fibers. Okay. So let's go ahead and what he's gonna ask us, see what he's going to ask us. Set the angle of incidence to 45 and change the incident medium. Okay. And then transmit medium to water. Oh, medium to glass. And oh, if you want me to put the transmitting medium to water, which direction the transmit light bands? Away or towards the normal? Should be this, uh, you know, should be the same as with air, right? But it's not going to be at that angle that you saw. Glass water interface. Let's put the glass water interface instead of glass air interface. Water, here you go. You're going to see that the angle of total internal reflection is gonna be much steeper than the case for air glass. Close to 63, 63 degrees, right? Okay, right in here. That's the critical angle. Okay, let's predict this angle using that equation. So I'm gonna go there to excel the angle should be going to go to the equation you know theta and uh, n of incidence is actually arc and let's see arc sine a sine n of incidence which is 1.5 divided by 1.33, which is the refractive index of water. But don't forget to change this result to degrees, right? When you do that, what we, oh, you didn't get it? Let's see what's going on. A sine degrees. Going on here, let's see what's going on here. I believe it's arc sine. Okay, mistyped the function. No, I didn't. Okay, it doesn't look like he likes the division there inside. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, wait a minute. 
Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And of incident. Ha. He got it, he got it wrong, okay? He got the equation wrong. He switched. Okay, let's do that in, the, in my, my own notes. He switched the, the ratios here. Okay, so let's correct that again. Let's see go. That's the equation. Okay, here you go. Total internal reflection. Here you go. I'm going to put the notation of the book. And I, in the surface fraction of the of the medium of incidence of the light, sine theta of incidence, in this of a fraction of the transmitted medium, sine of the angle of transmission, right? We go, N1 is being replaced by Ni. Theta i is being hit, theta one is being replaced by theta i, and so on. Keep with the notation of the nodes. We go. Watch out for those mistakes in the handouts. Right? We go the transmission angle is 90 degrees for total internal reflection. When the transmission angle is 90 degrees, the theta of incidence becomes theta critical. Sine of 90 degrees is one, so it becomes NT, right? Yeah, and here should be an incidence. And T, okay, we go. That's why I was not getting the right result because I was getting the wrong formula. Is N of transmission divided by N, N of incidence. Okay, you got the wrong result here again. Please correct that. Now I can get the right result in my equation. If I go to the spreadsheet, it goes 1.33. 1.5. And I gotta change that from radians to degrees. What do I get? Oh, you get the oh, because I put the I mistyped my function. Okay, now I got it 62 degrees. 62.45 degrees. Let's see what I got for my. Yeah, I got 62 degrees here as well. Let's see, 62.8. What am I getting here? 62.45 is close enough, right? And let's see what we he wants. What else he wants us to do? Predict the critical angle. Okay, I predict the critical angle, and then we can take the percentage difference. Change the incident to water and the transmitting medium to glass, and repeat the step three to observe the IR. Incident medium to water. Oh, yeah. Then you change the incident medium to water and the transmitting medium to glass. Do you observe the IR? No, you're not going to observe the IR. But let's do that anyway. Okay, here's gonna be water. And remember, 
TIR happens only when the incident medium has a higher refractive index than the transmitted medium. Only. I'm going to put glass here. No matter what the angle that you have, you're not going to have total internal reflection. Okay? No matter how shallow. See? The only moment that you have total internal reflection is at 90 degrees incidence. That's the only moment that you have total internal reflection. Okay, so that's what we have for this chapter, for this chapter, for this lab. Results and conclusions. Let's take a look at the book and what this material. What's going to be the sections of this material that was covered in the lab? You write that down there and we go magnetic materials. You are not going to do that. We are going to do. Close it. Uh, magnetic plate and optics. Here you go. Wave front. Uh, you can, yeah, read this one. Okay, 23.1. Light rays, ray, uh, light can be modeled as, as rays. We didn't talk about Huygens principle. But it's, you don't need to know that. If once you understand that light behaves just like rays, it's like a geometrical approach to optics. Reflection of, of light. Okay, you're, you're not gonna, you can skip this. Let me tell you what you need to know. Let me, lecture notes. Chapter 23, 23.1, 23 read sources of light, waves, fronts, and rays, and geometric optics. Okay, you can skip uh, Huygens principle, 23.2. The loss of reflection, we, we, we covered that. And reflection transmission. You can skip the specular and diffuse reflection. 23.3. Uh, reflection is Snell's law. It's Snell's law, yeah. Take a look at Snell's law. We are not doing dispersion of a prism. Skip dispersion. In a prism. Okay. It's total internal reflection with this. Reflection, let's see. Fiber optics, photophone. Oh, yeah, Bell's photophone. Okay. Here you go. Bell, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, he patented a photophone. If that's mentioned in some publications in optics. So you can read everything, read everything. Just an application of what we discussed here. Uh, is skip 23.5. We're not going to do polarization. Okay. And 
that's what we cover today. Chapter 23 for this lab. What comes next is the next lab. Let's take a little break now. Six, let's see, four to 20. Right now, two twenty. Twenty two two thirty five. Okay, any questions? I still have to prepare the homework for this chapter, so bear with me and I'll be posting the homework for this chapter very soon and the other ones as well. Okay, I see you soon in fifteen minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just found it out. Thank you, so folks. Uh, let me start sharing the screen. I just saw this your your chat message, but you know I'm gonna send you. Okay, oh, the fat simulation that uh, that has the link there no longer works. Okay, the software that we use to to run that simulation they discontinued. So. Apparently, FAT didn't replace that simulation. So we are going to use something else that's in the internet. Let me send you the link for this one. Everybody, everyone. Here you go. Go to this link. Okay. You should see something like that. Lens. That's geometrical optics. Okay. It's rather, you know, simple theory. And uh, in real life, we use real lenses and you do everything the way it is described right here in the simulation. We put an object, the object can be a light source and we project the image of this object in a screen. The lens is between the object and the image. It works pretty well. You can see that at naked eye. That's how cameras work and even that's how the eye works as well. The eye projects an image in the retina. We have a lens in front of the, our eyeball and whatever we are seeing right now is an image just like this one. It should be, the image should be upside down, okay, that we see. But the brain processes the image so you can see everything upside, upright. The brain does some signal processing, right? So instead of having us see the world upside down, the brain is just like a computer that makes the image upright. <clears throat> so we're gonna use this in conjunction with the virtual lab right here. We're gonna use converging lenses. So here you go. Oh, uh, lab notes right in here. So the next one is lab 11. Lenses. Okay. I'm gonna use ray optics to predict the formation an image of an image of an image of the image of a to predict the formation of the image of an object
So if you went, to, if you go to the movie theater, you know that there is a projector there in the back of the room, right? That's projecting that that movie, that those moving pictures in the screen of the movie theater. So what you have there is a lens that's doing this projection. And what you see in the screen is the image of the object that's there in the projection room. The image, the, the object of, uh, that I'm referring to is just like, for instance, a negative or a digital negative, I would say, okay? This chapter corresponds, this, this material corresponds to the following in the book, okay? We're gonna do only scene lenses. So we're gonna skip mirrors. We're gonna skip spherical mirrors. We're gonna start with scene lenses. 23.9. So you can add 23.9 to the list of, you know, 23.6, let's see, 23.6 formations through reflection and refraction. Yeah, no, 23.6, we're not going to skip. Okay, uh, formation of image but only through reflection, formation of image, through refraction only, skip reflection, but we're not gonna do mirrors, 23.7, skip. Twenty-three point nine. What about twenty-three point nine? Scene lenses. Okay, so that uh, what we have for this chapter twenty-three. I'm going to prepare the homework for those sections. So you can practice it for the exam. Let's go to the okay. So what you have in a lens is the following: a lens, a, a positive lens that we call would be like a a convex lens, the surface would be convex, you know? It bulges out. We call this type of lens a spherical lens. This surface here is a spherical. Both surfaces are spherical. It's different radius of curvature. A lens like that has what we call a focal length. Ev, I'm gonna write that down here for you, lab notes. Every, you know, every lens has a focal length, lens. With two focal points, one in front of the lens. We call that F prime, we usually call that prime. And the other, in the back of the lens. Front and back is the sign with reference to the position of the object. The object, in other words, the object in the front, which is in the front of the lens. And the other point F in the back of the lens. There's a interesting interpretation for the focal point. You're going to understand why you call it focal point, okay? Hanging there, 
Uh, well, I'm gonna tell you right now. The focal point is the point where all light rays incident parallel to the axis of the lens. We point to the point where all light rays incident parallel to the axis of the lens, comma, is is refracted towards this point. That's what the focal point is all about. Let me show you what I mean about that. Do you see the, you know, here we have one focal point. This one I call the F prime. He call it the book, the, the simulation call it focus prime. And here is the, fo the other focal point F. You know, they call it focus. Notice that, you know, I want you to understand that every ray that travels parallel to this axis, here go, here is the, is the axis, the optical axis of the lens, which is perpendicular to the lens itself. Every light ray that moves, you know, parallel to this axis is diverted towards this focal point, okay? It doesn't matter if the, Image if the object is higher like that or low, lower, you know. Every light ray that follows a path parallel to the axis of the lens is going to be refracted towards this focal point. Okay. The focal point is a very important point of a lens. Do you see that? This point here doesn't change. Whether it's you know closer or far away. That's that's why you must define it. Every lens is manufactured with a given focal focal length. Every lens. In this specific case, this lens is manufactured with a focal point, with a focal length that is equal to four. See F here, focal length equal to four. There is the focal length and there is the focal point, right? The focal length is this distance. The focal length is the distance of the focal point to the center of the lens. Okay, so let's write it down. That is the Optical, there is the following one. The optical axis of the length perpendicular to the axis of the length perpendicular to the length. Let's put this way. Two. And there is the focal distance, which is the distance from the length to the focal point. The focal point. The focal point of the focal point to the length of the focal point to the length. If you're building a lens, there are ways to the lens is a given focal distance 10 centimeters one meter you know 50 centimeters and so on opticians know how to do that the focal point the focal length and the focal distance so when whenever you are 
solving problems like that of seam lenses, you have to do a drawing like that. Okay. The axis, the lens, and the focal points, F and F prime. If you want to know where the image of a given object is formed behind the lens, you position the object like a, an arrow like that, okay? At a given distance. Okay, so here you go. This object has three units of height. One, two, three, okay? And it is positioned at a distance of 11 units. Here is to the left is negative, to the right is positive. The, the optical axis runs from the left to the right. Here's the origin of your axis. If you want to find out the image, where the image of this object is formed, what do we do? You draw a ray parallel to the axis that goes from the tip of your object. And at the lens, this light ray is refracted because of the curvature of the lens towards the focal point, okay? That's one light ray one useful light ray that you can draw. But there's another useful light ray that you can draw too. You have this other light ray that goes from the tip of the object that passes through the center of the lens. And this light ray is not uh, refracted. It is refracted, but the direction of propagation doesn't change. It's not bent at all. This lens is supposed to be a thin one. And then we have finally a third light ray that passed through the F prime point. The path of this light ray is just the opposite of the path of this light ray. Do you see that? Parallel passing through the focus. Now this one passes through the focus and is refracted parallel. If you do everything right, properly, you know, with all the drawings the proper scale you're going to find out that all those three light rays intercept at the same point just like this figure shows the interception of this of this point is where the tip of the ob the image of the tip of the object is formed so this arrow that was upright becomes a down an arrow that's downright uh, downwards upward right becomes the, downward okay so learn that this technique okay three light rays i'm gonna write that down for you so let's see if i have There is no, by the way, there's no lab report for this lab, right? There's no report for this lab. Uh, no report for this lab. Find out the position of the image of an object. The following. The following. One. Draw a not right arrow. A even position. Front of the lens to draw 
a light ray from the tip of the object. Parallel to the optical axis. Okay. This light ray is then refracted towards the focal point. Draw three light rays. Here you go. Three light rays. So, the first light ray. Here you go. First, first light ray. Here you go. First light ray. You want to do like that. Like that. Okay, second light ray. I'm just documenting what you saw in that drawing. Second light ray. Second light ray. On the tip of the object. Passing to the center of the lens. This light, light ray passes through the lens with no you know, change in direction. Okay. Those two light rays alone are enough to for you to find out the position of the image. Those two light rays alone, okay? These two light rays alone, I didn't ask to find the position of the image, which corresponds to their intersection. Oh, every you need a third light ray. What do we do? If you need a third light ray. You can use a third light ray as well. From the tip of the object, passing, uh, let's see, through the F prime focal point from in front of the lens. Upon reaching the lens, upon reaching the lens, the lens, the light ray propagates parallel to the auto axis. Okay. Two light rays, let, let's go here. Two light rays are enough to find the position of the image. You don't need three light rays, two are enough. But if you do three light rays, make sure that the third light ray intersect, intersect with the other two as well. Okay? Now let's see what he's asking us to do.
Okay, in this specific case, is the focal length of this lens positive or negative? Okay, something else that you gotta know. You know, positive focal length, you know, convex lenses have a positive focal length located the back of the lens. Okay. Concave lenses have a negative focal length located in front of the lens. So let's go to the simulation here. Here you go. See that? This one, this lens here is a positive lens, is a is a convex lens. Concave and convex. Let's see if we can change it to concave lens. Uh, it doesn't look like we can. Let's see here. Yeah, it doesn't look like we can. Hmm. There must be a way to do that. Let's see. Oh gosh, simulation of image formation. Come on. Move the tip of the object. Arrow to move the object. Move the point named focus. To, oh, to change the focal length. You can change the focal length as well. Let's see. Oh, okay. it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't change for some reason. Huh. We can change the, oh yeah, we can. Okay, here you go. Let me see if I can, oh yeah, here you go. That's how we change from positive to negative lens. See that? This is a negative lens, concave lens. This is a positive lens. Okay. With a focal point 5.86. I'm gonna put six here. So go ahead and write that down. Is this image real or virtual? There are real images and there are virtual images. What's the definition? Let's take a look at the definition. There are real and virtual images. Real images. And the ones that it can project in screen, just like the image form then your movie theater, in the screen of your movie theater. Virtual images cannot be projected in the screen. Okay. Real images are the ones that you can project on the screen, you know, in the back, in the back of the lens. Virtual images cannot be projected in the screen and are formed in the front of the lens. The difference between real and virtual images. In this specific case, this image, oh, where's the image here? Oh, the image is very far away, see that? So let's see if we can change, okay. See here, this image is being formed in the back of the lens. So that is a real image. If I want to form a virtual image, there's a way to do that. I can, I can get this object closer and closer to the lens. And you're going to see, I can form the image in the front of the lens, see that? That's the image here that I'm forming just by putting this object between the focus and the lens. Okay. So there is this, these two types of images. There, there are others, okay, virtual and Virtual and uh, real, right? Here we go. 
real image. The image can also be inverted or upright. Okay, in this case, the virtual image is upright and the real image is inverted. Let's go back here. Upright or inverted. This image is inverted. Now you gotta find out where the image is magnified, diminished, diminished, or about the size of the object. Let's take a look. You got uh, this. Let's see. This object is what? This object has. Okay, here's the height of the object 2.23 height of the object 2.23 height of the image is 2.42 so the image is being magnified okay because the length of the image is larger than the length of the object and the length of the image depends where the object is located with respect to the lens Okay, the closer an object is to the focus, the larger the image is. The further the object is to the focus, the smaller the image becomes. See that? So, as a rule of thumb, is that if uh, the image is at twice the focal length, there is no magnification whatsoever. And let me give you the formula. You know, we can come up with a formula that uh, determine all those, those things that you see here, the position of the image, the height of the image and so on, okay? So let's go here. Let me see if he has it here. Oh yeah, right in here. That's the equation. Position of the object, the inverse of the position of the object plus the inverse of the position of the image is equal to the inverse of the focal distance. Okay. We're going to stick only to real objects. No, don't worry about virtual objects. Virtual objects are too complicated. But Images, you have to know what a real image is and what a virtual image is. Okay, so if you want to know the position of those things, you have to know the, if you want to know the position of the image, you have to know the position of the object and the focal distance. Okay, so let's see here. Let's do this, this, table that you see right in here. We're going to position the object at different positions. Here we go. Uh, and we are also going to set the focal length of this object. Let's see. Is this image upright or inverted? Does the image look like magnified initial about the same size of the object? Find the focal length by clicking the ruler box. Yeah, we cannot do that, right? We cannot do that, but here we go. For our specific case, yeah, we can do for this one. It's four units. For this specific case, the focal length is four units. Okay. Let's see what else we have here. Yeah. So play, you know, play with this simulation. And uh, I want you to do the following. Let's, let's do like that, you know. Uh, put your focal point as being four units and put your object at different positions. Minus, you know, minus five, minus six, minus seven, minus eight, right? That's the distance. By the way, this is a distance, okay? And the object is real, it's not virtual. The object, for this case, always wanna be positive. The distance of the object is always gonna be positive. 
let's let's do that. Here you go. Uh, one, two, three. Let's see how many. Let's do the, the table, but with different numbers. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's see if I can do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Okay. Let's go get here. To, let's go to our. Um, nice. Nice. D O. I'm going to put the, uh, you know, arbitrary units U. Yeah, arbitrary units. And then he's asking also one D O. One divided by arbitrary units, one divided by the i. Units, one divided by arbitrary units. We have one more hour to go. We're going to focal lengths, by the way. Don't forget focal lengths, U. In this case, the focal length is four. I set up four. I'm going to put the distance of the object five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, let's put seven data points. One, two, three, four, 11. Okay, we start here at 11. And then you measure this distance you're already given here in your 6.29. DO is 11, 6.29. Then, oh, sorry, zero, 6.29 is here. So let's start with six, with five. Here you go, five. Yeah, it's 20. We put the object at six. The eye is 12. Then at six, seven. The eye is 9.33. Eight. Okay, so note see that twice the focal length, you get the same position for the image, same distance for the image. Okay, so you go ahead and eight, you also get eight. Nine, seven point two. Then six point six seven. Here we go. Okay, if you plot those two, you're not going to get a, a linear equation.
you don't get a linear equation there. But if you plot those two here, which I'm going to, you got one divided by five, right? One divided by 20. You go. Insert. You do get a straight line. Let's put the trend line. Oh, no, no not what I want. Add trend line. Play equation chart. Here you go. Here's the equation. Here is one divided by di, and x is one divided by do. You have this slope that's almost minus one. See that? Minus 0.992. And this intercept that's almost 0.25, which is one divided by four. Okay. So that's the equation that you. So go back here to our equation. Here you go, that's the equation. Medical lenses. So what you see right in there is something like that. You are plotting one over the i. Okay. Go. The slope is minus one. X is one divided by D naught. And the intercept is one divided by F. In that specific case, F is equal to four units. A very good rule of thumb is that if D naught, if D I is greater than D naught, and the image is magnified, it's magnified. Let's go back here to the, here you go. The I in this case is less than the not, so the image is not magnified. Okay, but, and that uh, magnification occurs if the object is placed between the focal point and the radius of, and the twice the focal point, the, the, fo the focal distance and twice the focal distance. In this case, we have a magnification of two minus two because the image is inverted. Okay. So let me see if there is any questions there in the chat window. No, no, no questions, right? Ideally, you should be practicing that in the pen and paper, okay? Why don't you do that for the exam? You know, practicing, drawing all these arrows and the lenses and the lens, okay? Choose whatever focus you want. And then do these drawings with the light rays parallel to the axis and passing through the center of the lens and passes through the focal point, the, the focal prime point, right? The one in front of the lens. 20. Let's uh, take another break.
Let's see what else he wants. Before we take another break, let me take a look here. What else he wants us to do? Yeah, we did that. The only thing that you have to know is the magnification. Okay, here you go. Di over D naught. Remember I told you, if the i is greater than D naught, then the, you're gonna have a magnified image. Magnified image means M greater, magnitude of M is greater than one, okay? So let's see, what else? It's called rays. Yeah, that's all I want to cover with you folks for this for this one. Uh, we can stop here. We don't have any questions. Yeah, we can stop here. Will there only be one attempt on the final exam? I haven't decided that yet. I, I, I let you have to take like three attempts, right, in the partial exam. I think I'm going to keep three attempts. Okay, Donica? I think I'm gonna let you have more than one attempt, yeah? Just like the other ones. And then if you have an additional attempt, a little bit of points are subtracted from each attempt. I believe I was subtracting what, 5.5% or 10%, I don't remember, okay? Just to distinguish from those students that got it right in the first attempt, you know? But I think it's, uh, it's a good solution to do that. Uh, and, you know, just uh, cover the material for those final chapters that are discussing here in the lab. I think it's a good way to not overload you for the final exam. Uh, well, I, I gotta see what was the, the, the grades in the third exam. I still didn't see it. Okay, Annabella. So I, I haven't decided yet. I haven't decided yet, okay? I like to do high, uh, difficult homeworks so you are prepared for the final exam. That's what I like to do. So for instance, I do difficult questions for the homework, but then I do easy or, or you know, medium questions for the, for the exam. I like to do like that. You did better. Okay, that's good. You did better in the third exam. I'm glad. <laughs> okay, no, any more questions? Okay, let's meet again for the last time on Wednesday. I'll have your exams corrected. Okay, uh, your exams correct. I'll have your, I gotta go back to your lab reports, right? Hopefully I'll have some of them corrected by Wednesday. I think the average of the exam or the highest score I'm taking, let me see, uh, there are three partial exams, okay, Jasmine, three partial exams. Out of the three partial exams, I drop the lowest score and take the average of the remaining two exams. You, you have to take the final exam. You have to take the final exam, okay? I don't drop the final exam grade. Um, I was wondering, since you're giving us three attempts, are you gonna take the average of the three or? No, no, it's the highest the score. It's the, hi it's the highest score, yeah. So that's okay. what, yeah, that what uh, connect us. They don't take the okay, average. Okay, because it's for me, the result, it, it's taking the average. So it's no, not replacing. It's not. No, it's not. I, I, well, if you wanna you know, double check on that, come by during my office hours, but, but I check with other students. The other students okay. thought that they were taking the average. And when, we, when I went through their grades in, my, in the Connect, it was clear that the Connect got the highest grade, okay? So you might okay. be mistaken there. So Connect does take the highest grade of your attempt. Any, any other questions? I actually do have another question. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I realized um, during the exam three that um, I wasn't inputting my answers correctly. Um, and the only reason why I realized it was because, you know, it allowed us to see the wrong answers. 
And I noticed that there were all of them because I didn't input them correctly. Um, I didn't know that you had to use a capital E instead of the times 10. So I was wondering if it was possible, if I got, if it was possible to look back at my it's, other it's, exams. Well, uh, I, I, I got to look into that, okay? There was another student there that was asking that. And, uh, you know, it, it's, for me to do that is going to be lots of work. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking whether to do it or not. That's the second time you folks are taking this course with, uh, with Connect, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll be making a decision before attending the grades, the final grades. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so I see you on Wednesday. Thank you, Professor. Welcome.